back to the second of these lectures. Um, <clears throat> I've given you a handout, and the handout is actually rather independent of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I've added some materials to the handout, but um, there's a certain element of, un of the unexpected in this lecture because I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say. And I always used to say to my students, you better listen to what I'm about to say because I have no idea what it is and I shan't remember it afterwards. So <laughs> I think that's called chaos. And um, my son believes in chaos theory, but I don't know what chaos theory is. But I think I know what chaos is. Um, and it's pretty much how I operate. So um, this, is the, this is the formal title of my talk. Um, in fact, it's, I keep changing the title, so you put, we better ignore that one um, and go on to the main topic. I mean, the main thing I want to talk about today is the idea of collaboration. And what is collaboration? Of course, we know about collaboration with the enemy when you collaborate with the Japanese or the Germans, but I'm not talking about that kind of collaboration. I'm talking about when more than one person works on a project of translation. And I'm talking about um, collaboration in the world of translation. And of course, eventually, I shall be talking about the collaboration between myself and my, my teacher and friend David Hawkes on, on the great novel, Hung Lo Mung. But before I do that, I want to step back a bit and have a few more general reflections on the very nature of collaboration. Because what is collaboration, after all? I mean, simply put, it's when, one, when more than one person works together. Co collabor, you know, it, it literally in Latin, it means working together, you see. Labor means work, and co means cum, means with. So, but, but um, and it, it's, it's a very interesting fact that in the translation of Chinese literature, collaboration is very common. And, um, you know, I stopped and thought about that for a moment. Why is that the case? And, of course, the simple reason is that Chinese is such a horribly difficult language that very few foreigners are um, stupid enough to spend their lives learning it. So they think there's a shortcut by getting together with a Chinese person, and um, that's the most common kind of collaboration between a foreigner and a Chinese. Um, and that's very common and often quite successful. But I thought I would just um, look at some of the examples um, in history of the kind of collaborations there have been. And of course, the very first, the, really the very first example was the great missionary Robert Morrison and there's a famous picture of him with his Chinese assistants. But he was mainly um, a man who created a dictionary and um, various other materials. He wasn't really a literary translator. Um, but even, even in his work, he needed the, the presence of um, more than one Chinese collaborator. So he's really the first in a long line. In fact, I could go further back than that, but for, for the purposes of today, I'll just go back as far as Robert Morrison in about the year 1800. And then, of course, the, f the very famous example of James Legg, who I talked about two years ago. And he had a very wonderful collaborator, a gentleman uh, from Shanghai by the name of Wang Ta. And you see him in this picture. Um, I'm not sure if I can... This is a very famous photograph of... I won't fall over the edge. This is a famous photograph of James Legg who spent most of his life in Hong Kong, you know, and translated uh, many of the Chinese classics. I gave a long talk about him two years ago, so I'm not going to go on much. But he's, this is when he went back to Scotland on a holiday, and he invited his collaborator, Wang Tao. Well, you look at Wang Tao there, he looks like a servant. He looks like he's about to serve tea or something, you know. <laughs> but actually, Wang Tao was a really quite a distinguished um, Chinese man of letters, a Wenren. And he wrote very good classical Chinese. And in later life, he retired to Shanghai. And he wrote some wonderful sort of stories in the style of Liao Jai, you know. He was quite a, he was a, very, a very good person, a very, very bad person in lots of ways. I mean, he certainly wasn't a Christian. And he led rather a dissolute life. But somehow, James Legg, this formidable man, 
managed to work together with Wang Tao over many years. And Wang Tao did most of the hard work, you know. Wang Tao prepared editions of the classics and summaries and so on. He did a lot of what in today's world, in, in today's world we'd have called him a research assistant, but maybe a senior research assistant or even a senior research associate. He was, he was really a very important figure. Um, and um, another example of collaboration which I particularly like because of this wonderful, lovely French lady. Her name was Judith Gautier, and um, she was the daughter of, of a very great poet called Théophile Gautier, one of the great French poets of the mid-19th century. And um, she was renowned for her beauty, and one of the great painters, John Singer Sargent, he's an American portrait painter, he made several paintings of her. Oh, Christ. Oh, yes, here we go. That's one of her, you know, typical French pose, and there's another one. And, and this lady, she was a really amazing woman. She must have had about, I don't know how many uh, famous lovers in her life. But when she was a young teenager um, at home, her father um, found her a young Chinese man. He was drifting around Paris. I won't go into all the details. It's quite an interesting, it's quite a romantic story. And so her father, um, got her together with this young Chinese guy and they, to, between them, they sort of produced the most wonderful book of poems, Chinese poems, in French translation. It was called Le Livre de Jade, The Book of Jade. And it's a fascinating book because some of the poems we can recognize as being famous poems by Li Bai and so on, some of them we honestly don't know where they came from. Probably the young Chinese gentleman made them up, you know. And anyway, they spent many happy mornings together playing around with Chinese poetry. It was a kind of, I think you'd call that collaboration as flirtation, you know. They were certainly having a nice time and they, they enjoyed themselves very much. And of course, the end result was a very remarkable book partly because she inherited her father's poetic gifts. And it was a very influential book in the history of the Chinese, of, of the translation of Chinese poetry. Um, an, a less known example is a Swedish um, scholar of Chinese painting called Oswald Siren. And most people think that he was responsible for all these books. He wrote lots and lots of books on Chinese painting, on Chinese gardens and so on. And um, I only discovered by chance, quite recently, that the person who really did all the work of translating all these writings from the Chinese was a, a very wonderful gentleman by the name of Yang Zhou Han. Yang Zhou Han, who I knew personally. <clears throat> this is a picture of him in his later years. He, um, he was a great um, scholar and translator. He, he translated from the Latin into, into Chinese. And he helped, for about five years, <clears throat> he helped Oswald Siren with his, with his work. So they were a kind of collaboration team. Um, I thought I had another picture of Jan Johan, maybe not, maybe later. Um, and then there's a famous, a very famous example of collaboration between the poet, between um, Ezra Pound and, um, and the Catalan-American scholar of, of art. And as Fenaloza, they never met. They never met. But it was a collaboration in the sense that after Fenaloza's death, <clears throat> um, Pound was given his notebooks by Fenaloza's widow. And on the basis of those notebooks, he produced this very famous little book of translations from Chinese poetry called Cafe. So that's a kind of collaboration where people don't actually get to meet, you know. Um, but it's an interesting form of collaboration. Um, the very great <clears throat> German translator, Richard Wilhelm, who translated the Yi Jing, he translated Zhuangzi, Tao uh, Te Ching, much Lianzi, lots and lots of Chinese philosophy. He, on his translation of the Yi Jing, he collaborated with a wonderful old gentleman by the name of Lao Naixian, who was a great figure in the Chinese um, literary world at the time. So, and theirs was a very deep collaboration because what happened was Wilhelm translated the I Ching into, into German and then he translated his translation back into Chinese so that Lan Aixuan could see whether he was being accurate. 
So that was, it went on for several years. They lived together in the city of Qingdao in Shandong. And that's a very famous example of collaboration between a Westerner and a Chinese, which, which became a very, very widely read book, perhaps the most widely read book in translation from the Chinese of all time. Um, another example that's not so well known is between the American poet Witta Binner and um, his friend um, uh, Jiang Kanghu, who, who lived in California, and they knew each other in California for about 10 or 15 years. And between the two of them, they produced um, this famous translation of Tang Shi San Bai Shou. Um, and um, this man was a very interesting person. I mean, if you read his life, he, was, he just happened to be in California at the same time as Witta Binner, who was a young poet. And they struck up a very deep friendship. Um, and the result of that friendship was the, the translation of the, of the Tang Shi San Bai Shou. And, um, and then later on, poor old, poor old um, Jiang Kang Hu, he went back to China and he got, he got drawn into the, um, the Nanjing government of Wang Jingwei. And then after the war, he was put in prison and he died in, he died in jail in 1954. He was considered to have been a, a political traitor. So he was actually a collaborator in both senses of the word. He was a literary collaborator, but he was also considered by the communist authorities to have been a political collaborator and traitor because he worked in Nanjing for Wang Jingwei. But he, he was a very fine scholar, that's for sure, and a man of, a man of all kinds of ideas. And he and Witter Binner produced a very successful um, version of the Tang Shi San. There it is, you see. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm pressing the wrong button here. Um, another example of collaboration, which is very little known, is between the English poet Gerald Bullitt. Um, there are his dates, who wrote many books, many, many slim volumes of verse, several novels, and so on. He was a kind of English man of letters. And he, he got to know um, a Chinese gentleman called, called um, Cui Ji, there's his name. And Cui Ji himself wrote a book called A Short History of Chinese Civilization. Cui Ji, not much is known about Cui Ji. He was from Jiangxi province and he lived in England during the 1930s. And he died quite young, I know, of, of TB. And Gerald, Gerald Bullitt was his good friend. And but between the two of them, they published um, a collection of poems by, by the Song Dynasty poet, Fan Chengda. And um, it, was re, it was republished in the 1980s by Chinese University Press as a renditions book. It's a very beautifully produced little book. And um, this was another, it was another collaboration based on friendship. I, I was led to believe by David Hawkes, who visited them when Cui Ji was dying of, of TB, I was led to believe by David that they were in fact a gay couple, but I, I can't prove that, Not, nor do I care. Um, this is another famous collaboration which is, has a Hong Kong connection because the, the really outstanding American poet, Kenneth Rexroth, um, was very interested in Chinese poetry and he himself translated a number of poems by Du Fu and others. And then quite late on, he met um, Zhong Ling, who of course taught for many years in Hong Kong, is now teaching in Macau, and she's a very old friend of mine. And the two of them worked together um, and became very good friends. And um, they worked together on two books. One was a collection of women poets. They were way ahead of their time. I mean, nowadays, you know, they keep producing more and more books about Chinese women poets. But when they produced this in 1972, you know, that's a long time ago. And it's a very lovely book of translations. It's often criticized for making the poems too kind of sexy, you know. But frankly, I don't think that's a mistake. I think that's a great recommendation, actually. I think one should make things as sexy as possible. Um, and this is the same book under a different title. They also worked on the great Li Qingzhao. They produced a very nice book of translations. So theirs was another collaboration based on a, a very close friendship. Um, this is an interesting case of collaboration because the, the great novel Jin Ping Mei was translated way back um, in the 1930s um, by um, a retired English 
military officer called Clement Egerton, who had nothing much to do, so he retired in London and he started learning Chinese. And by pure chance, he bumped into the young um, writer Lao She, who was at that time working in London. And Lao She had moved in and lived with Clement Egerton for quite a, quite a period of time, and together they translated Jinping Mei into English. Um, Lao She never liked to admit that he did that, because of course, in, after 1949, it wouldn't have been considered terribly sort of politically correct to translate um, an erotic novel such as Jinping Mei into English. But there's no doubt about it that he, he was one of the joint authors of this translation. And there's Lao She. Um, a different kind of collaboration, a little bit like Oswald Siren, is the, is the case of Joseph Needham. And Joseph Needham, when he began writing his huge history of Chinese science, relied very, very heavily on Chinese collaborators. And that was the book, you see. And the, and, and, and the um, let me try and get this red thing. There we are. Wang Ling, who was his, his collaborator for volumes one and two of this wonderful work. He, he, was, he was a Chinese scholar. I knew him quite well. He, um, he, he eventually moved to Australia, but he was a great historian of Chinese mathematics. So he was Joseph Needham's collaborator. And after him, there were several others, of course. And then, of course, the famous um, Nobel Prize winning author, Pearl Buck, who lived quite a lot of her life in China. She produced a long translation of Shui Hu Zhuang, which she called All Men Are Brothers. And she had, uh, she had a teacher, a Chinese teacher, whose name I've forgotten, but he helped her a great deal on that project. Then there was this rather delightful gentleman called Harold Acton, who lived in, in, in Beijing during the 1930s. He taught at Beida. And he, he got to know quite a number of young, um, young writers and poets. In, in Beijing, and he produced one of the earliest anthologies of Chinese poetry and translation. And one of the people he worked with um, over the years was a gentleman by the name of Chen Shixiang. And this is Chen Shixiang here, um, with the great art critic Bernard Berenson. So Chen Shixiang was a very, very um, lively young Chinese scholar who ended up teaching in California, but he in his, in his earlier years, he worked with Harold Acton, and, in, and they produced a, a joint translation of the great play um, uh, Tao Hua Shan, The Peach Blossom Fan. Two ladies, two American ladies, who I've, I'm very fond of, Florence Ayskoff and Amy Lowell, had what, what I suppose one would call a very intense um, and probably lesbian friendship. And in the course of that friendship, they produced a very important book called Fur Flower Tablets, poems translated from the Chinese. And Florence Ayskoff, she knew some Chinese, but she did the first draft. She produced the first draft. And then Amy, Amy Lowell, who was a very well-known American poet from Chicago, she did the final polishing. So often you get this kind of collaboration where the f one person does the rough draft, the second person does the polishing. And then we come to the wonderful couple of Yang Xianyi and his wife. And this is when they were young. You see, she was a very beautiful young woman. And Yang Xianyi went to Oxford. And Gladys, as her name was, she was studying Chinese at Oxford. And she actually had a boyfriend. In fact, I think they were engaged. But Yang Xianyi swept her off her feet. And um, he was a playboy in those days, very wealthy. His father was the manager of the Bank of China in Tianjin. And Yang Xianyi was spending money like water and inviting everybody to parties. And he'd say to them, let's go to Paris for the weekend. And all his friends in Oxford would say, we've got no money. How can we? Oh, I'll pay for everything. I'll get daddy to send me some more money. So he was the rich boy in, Ho in Oxford. And Gladys, of course, um, fell madly in love with him, and eventually they ran off to China together. They got married and ran off to China, and they spent the rest of their life working in China as probably the most famous collaborative team of translators. And um, in a sense, they, they did follow the pattern whereby Xian Yi, whose Chinese was superb, he would trans and his English was wonderful too, he would translate the first draft, and then Gladys, 
um, who knew a lot, who, whose Chinese was pretty good, but she was a native speaker of English, she would polish it up into the final version. So hundreds of things appeared under their joint names during the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and that, that they were a very, very productive couple. And this is a picture of them a bit later, probably after they got to China. And this is a picture of them when I knew them. I knew them very well in the 1980s. My family used to go and stay with them in Peking. And um, they were very, very kind and um, hospitable people. Um, Robert Payne was a very prolific um, writer who wrote novels and historical studies. And he ended up, by pure chance, ended up teaching in Kunming during the war, during the Japanese war. He was, uh, he was on the staff of the Xinan Nian Da. And when he was in Kunming, he got to meet lots and lots of young Chinese um, gifted writers. And together with them, he produced... He, he, pol he polished up their drafts, again, these were his Chinese assistants, he polished up their drafts to produce what is still a very good anthology of Chinese poetry called The White Pony, edited by Robert Payne, you see. And if you go through the translations in this book, you'll find the names of many young Chinese who were at that time in Kunming, including Wen Yidou, for example, and various others. So that's another form of collaboration. Now, um, so that's by way of a kind of general introduction. Um, I think I'll sit down for a moment. Um, thank you. And the, um, the fact of the matter is that in Chinese translation, collaboration is very, very common. And as I've said, I think, I'll just hold it a second. I think, I think the, um, the reason primarily is that there simply aren't enough foreigners who know enough Chinese to do it on their own. Of course, if you look at the people I talked about two years ago, um, Herbert Giles and Arthur Whaley, they never collaborated. Their translations were always done by themselves. All of Arthur Whaley's books were produced um, single-handedly. He taught himself Chinese, he taught himself Japanese, and then he went on during his lifetime to produce, you know, I think almost 20 books of translations. So he never collaborated, nor did Herbert Giles. Um, and um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, by far the majority of translations are done of Chinese literature, and I've only mentioned a few of them. By far the majority are are done in collaboration. I myself um, have, in recent years, collaborated with my students. And that's, that's a very common model here in Hong Kong, where you have people teaching translation, like myself, and then you have young students who graduate and they have to produce a, a lengthy piece of translation, so they work together with their teacher. And it's a form of collaboration. Um, I've done that many, many times. It's very enjoyable. Um, and it's part of the whole practice of translation. So it's a very common thing. Um, okay, well now I come to the main topic of today's talk, which is the, the, the collaborative translation of Hong Lo Meng, which I shall refer to throughout simply as Stone for short, okay? Stone is, is the translation, the story of the stone is the way that this book was put on the market. It was actually taken from the other, the other title, of course, Shi Tou Ji, the story of the stone. So I'm just calling it stone. Um, and I'm beginning with what I call the genesis. And the genesis means, you know, how it originated. Because things don't just come out of nowhere, you know. Every major translation project is given birth to, you know, after a long process of, of gestation, you know, it takes a long while to get things to happen. You don't just suddenly, um, you know, I'm not going to walk out today and decide, oh, well, I'm going to translate, you know, Shui Hu Zhuan or something. It takes time. You think about it. You make plans. You discuss it. And most importantly, you discuss it with publishers. And publishers are an absolute key factor in the history of translation, in the practice of translation. Without a sympathetic 
publisher. Without a supportive publisher, you can achieve virtually nothing. You can just put, put your manuscripts in a drawer and forget about them. But in the case of this particular story, um, the publisher played a very important role in the genesis of this translation. As you'll see, I'm, I'm basically going to tell the story of this whole collaboration using mainly, as, as we get on with the story, using mainly letters written by David Hawkes to me. I was going to use the letters written by me to David Hawkes, but I simply ran out of time, so I think I might talk about them next week, because I've got a huge pile of letters. Um, and let me say at, at the commencement that these letters from David to myself, from David Hawkes to me, there are 75 of them. They're now in a private collection in Taiwan, but the owner of them has very graciously given me permission to use them as I see fit. So he's a very um, idealistic person who wishes to see this information widely disseminated, and um, that's why I'm able to use them today. They're not in the Chinese University archive. They are in, private, in a private collection. Um, Now, to take this story back to its beginnings, we have to, um, we have to mention a man called Sir Alan Lane, one of, the great, one of the great figures in 20th century publishing. And he was the one who basically created Penguin Books um, in the 1930s, because he felt there was a need for, um, you know, paperbacks that were cheap, that were readily available on railway stations and so on, and that could, that could promote good, good writing to the wide public. I mean, he was an idealist, a real idealist. And he set up Penguin Books, and of course it was a runaway success. He had a good eye, he had a good eye for, a, for a business venture. And it grew and grew, and very early on, um, very early on, a division of Penguin Books was launched called Penguin Classics. That was in 1945. And the first editor of Penguin Classics was a translator called E. V. Ryu. And he translated, among other things, Homer and the Bible and the New Testament. And he, was a, he, he, he really promoted a style of translation that became the hallmark of Penguin Classics. And that was fluent versions by people who were scholars, but also fluent writers. It became a mark it became the trademark of Penguin Classics. And this is an important fact in considering the genesis of the Hong Lamong translation because it was Penguin Classics that commissioned the work in the first place. And therefore it took place in a publishing environment that was conducive to fluent, reader-friendly translations. Not sort of um, scholarly footnoted um, word for word translations, but translations that were very definitely reader friendly. And E. D. Ryu was the man who, who, who presided over Penguin Classics for over 20 years. Um, oh, God. Sorry. Now, um, publishers don't exist in a vacuum. Um, a publisher, I think, is a fascinating role in life to be a publisher because you act, you're between authors and translators and the reading public, but you're also, you receive constant suggestions from people around you, from scholars, from critics, from advisors, and every good publisher has a circle of advisors and their advisors are always, you know, saying, oh, have you heard of this wonderful book? Why don't you publish it? Or have you met this great young author? You should meet him. And every publisher has to say, okay, I'll meet them, I'll read it. And then they decide which are good and which are bad. So you've got, you've got the publisher with the publishing house, and then you've got around them, you've got authors, you've got translators, and you've got advisors. And in this case, the key person, actually, without whom the Hung Lo Mung translation would never have happened, was a gentleman called Arthur Cooper. And I use the word gentleman um, advisedly because he was a true old-fashioned English gentleman who lived in a beautiful country house, who worked... If you, look, if you look him up online, they'll tell you he was a diplomat. That's a polite way of saying he worked in intelligence, okay? He was in MI6. Right, and he was a, he was a spy basically, and he knew Chinese, and um, he was also a passionate translator 
of poetry. He published one book of uh, one popular book of translations by poem, of poems by Li Bo and and Du Fu, and and Arthur. Um, I had certain amount to do with Arthur, and he he had a wide circle of friends in London what you might call the literary set, you know. He knew people, he knew, he knew the literary world in London. And on one occasion, um, he met up with a woman called Betty Radici. Betty Radici was married to a man called Radici, which of course is the Italian word for root, but her real name was English, an English name, but she had become the editor of Penguin Classics after Evie Rue. So she was in charge of Penguin Classics. And she met, um, she met Arthur Cooper. I don't have a photograph of Arthur, but she met him for lunch in London. And he said to her, oh, have you ever come across this wonderful Chinese novel called The Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Lao Meng? And Betty said, no, Arthur, I've never read it. Oh, you must read it. And he got, he got her a copy of the only a reasonable translation at the time, which was from a German translation by a man called Franz Kuhn. And, and Betty read it in that heavily abridged version. And um, as a result, she, um, as a result, she got in touch with David Hawkes. Now David was a friend of Arthur Cooper's going back many years. And so Betty got in touch with um, with Arthur Cooper, and he said, the person to do this is David Hawkes. And at that point, the story gets a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm going to, at this point, try and find, um, I, wrote, I wrote what I called a timeline. I can't remember where I put it, somewhere here. Oh, here we are. So what I've done is I've, I've created a timeline, a sort of biographical chronology of two, the two people involved in this story, one of whom is, is um, David Hawkes, and this is his, these are the basic dates of his life, and the other person is, I'm ashamed to say, is me, and those are the basic dates of my life. And um, inevitably this story is going to be quite personal because I'm personally involved in it. So I'm not here to promote myself, but I'm here to try and tell the story of how this whole thing happened, because it changed my life completely. I mean, this is the, I'm talking about the last um, 58 years of my, Christ, yeah, sorry, uh, 58 years of my life, and this is, this is it, it all began with this. So obviously, I, 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 when I'm telling this story, I'm telling it from my own personal experience. So if we look at um, David's life, um, some of you may have heard my lecture about David two years ago. And this is, I'm trying not to repeat what I said then. But you see, he was born in 1923, and he read Chinese at Oxford. And then after the war, he went to Peking University, where he read Hung Lam Meng as a way of learning Chinese. He sat down in a courtyard with a, with a retired um, Manchu civil servant, and they read they read through Hong Lo Meng together as a way of trying to improve David's modern Chinese, because <laughs> believe it or not, Hong Lo Meng was considered to be modern by him. And then when he went back to Oxford, he was appointed to the chair, that he became the chair professor of Chinese at Oxford. In 1966, he went away for a year to Harvard on a sabbatical. I'll, I'll explain why that's important. And then in 1967, he came back to Oxford and he taught a course he taught a course on Hong Lo Meng, and I was the only student on the course. <laughs> okay, I don't know why that's funny, but anyway. Um, <laughs> in those days, there was a total number of four people studying Chinese. Um, not like today, you know. And, the, and um, we all did classical Chinese. We did, you know, the Shi Jing, we did Chun Chu Zuo Zhuang, we did Meng Zi, we did Lun Yu. You know, Dao Dao Jing, that was what we studied. We didn't do, you know, ni hao, that kind of stuff. We didn't, we didn't you know, go down to the Huo Cha Jan to Mai Chi Piao. It was not what we did. We did um, classical stuff. Anyway, um, I'll come to that later. And then in 1970, he suggested the collaboration. And that's when we signed the contract. So this story really um, begins for real in the year 1970. In 1971, he resigned 
from the Oxford chair. He just quit. He just walked into his office one day and said, I'm quitting. Because he wanted to translate Hong Lao Meng. It's as simple as that. Nobody does that today, but he did. He just quit because he knew that what he wanted to do with his life was to translate Hong Lao Meng. And in 1973, um, he, um, I've made a mistake here, sorry. In 1973, he, he published the first volume of the, of the story of the stone under the subtitle, The Golden Days. And in that same year, that should be 1973, he was, he was made a fellow of All Souls College in Oxford. All Souls College is a little bit like um, the Academia Sinica, the Zhongyang Yan Yuan in Taiwan. It's just for research, you see. So he was very lucky. And then in 77, volume two, and round about that time, he bought a hill farm in Wales to, to retire to and spent most of his time going backwards and forwards between Wales and Oxford. In 79, he came to Australia. 1980, the third volume was published. And in the year 2009, he passed away. Um, Okay, now this other, the second person involved in this story is myself. So it's going to be tricky for me because I have to try to tell the story as it really is. Um, I'm not going to tell you all the bad things about me, of course, but um, I was born immediately after the war. You see, I'm a typical um, a baby boomer. My father came back from the war. He fought in Europe. And I was born nine months later, you see. Um, and then I went, to, I went up to Oxford University and I read Chinese. But I also, um, I also came to Hong Kong for six months in late 1966. I came and spent uh, a number of months in Hong Kong studying Chinese. And I lived with a Chinese family of, with three children, um, two girls and a boy, Albert, Rosanna and um, Alice, that's right. And, um, I taught them English and French and music. That was my job. I was a family tutor, you see. I just advertised in the South China Morning Post one morning. I said, young Oxford student available for tutoring in English, French and music would consider any offers. I thought I wouldn't get a single offer. But the same evening I had an offer from this family and the next day I was employed and they gave me a little apartment up on the roof. They lived on Home Antin Hill. They were extremely wealthy and I became the family tutor. And it was a very lovely situation until I became a little bit too fond of one of the daughters. And so at that point, the mother just threw me out, you know, because <laughs> I was teaching her French irregular verbs, but unfortunately, they took on a slightly different coloring. And um, anyway, um, before, before being thrown out, I had conversations like this in which the mother, who was a bit like Jammu in Hulamang, right? Um, I'd always had my meals with the family and she, on one occasion she just said, if you want to understand our family, there's one book you have to read. And she wrote down the four characters, Hong Lo, the three characters, right? Hong Lo Meng. And of course, I knew how to read Hong and I, I didn't know how to read Lo, it was much too complicated and so was Meng. But I wrote them down and um, when I went back to Oxford in 19, um, early 1967, I asked the tutors at Oxford if they would teach me Hong Lao Meng, and the, the young lecturers, um, they both refused to teach it. They said it's a very dangerous book. Um, it will change your life. So, but, so I said, oh, that's a shame because it's on the syllabus. Oh, well, they said, if you wait until Professor Hawkes comes back from America, try him because he is crazy about Hong Lao Meng. That was the first time I heard about Professor Hawkes being crazy about Hong Lao Meng. So when he came back from his sabbatical leave in, the, in um, September, I said to him, would you teach me Hong Lao Meng? And his eyes lit up and he said, would I just, of course. And I was the only student and we read, it, we read the first 10 chapters together in class. And um, that was how I first encountered Hong Lao Meng, you see. Um, and I then graduated in 1966, 1968, sorry. I graduated from Oxford. And um, this is where I have to be a bit careful what I say, because in those days, that was the height of the hippie period, you know. And everybody was dropping out, you know. And I dropped out in a big way. I just completely gave up all academic aspirations and became a kind of rambling, um, 
ne'er do well. I just wandered around the place doing this, that, and the other. And this lasted for a very long time, actually. Um, and, um, and about two years later, I was not particularly sure what to do in my life, but I dropped in, in Oxford, I dropped in to see my former teacher, Professor Hawkes. And I said to him, oh, hello, David, I'd like to come back and do a PhD, you know. I was very, um, I was a bit stupid, actually. I didn't really understand how the world worked at all. Anyway, I said, I'd like to do a PhD. And he said, what would you like to do for your PhD? So I said, I'd like to translate Hong Mong. And he just looked at me like, you know, something had fallen out of the sky. And then after a pause, he said, oh, that's interesting. Um, I've just been approached by Penguin Books to translate Hong Lao Meng. Why don't we do it together? It was completely spontaneous. He just said it like that. And um, I said, okay, that sounds great. And I, I said goodbye, and I went home. I thought, I thought I'll never hear any more about it. Um, and then, of course, I did hear more about it, and we ended up doing it. But you see, I, in, in your handout, I've given you the account of that meeting, which was given by David to um, my former student, Connie Chan. Is Connie here today? No. Anyway, Connie wrote a very wonderful M. Phil thesis many years ago, which I supervised. And in the course of that thesis, she went to Oxford and she interviewed David Hawkes. And he told her the same story about how I turned up one day out of nowhere and announced my intention of translating Hung Lo Mung, and how he'd just been approached by penguins. And he felt very sorry for me. He thought, oh, you poor chap. I've just, you know, cornered the market for the next 20 years, and you're going to be left out. So he, out of, out of kindness, he just asked me if I would work, if I would collaborate with him. So suddenly, overnight, I became his collaborator. And that's, that's pretty much, that's then, right? And then I went off to America to try my hand at doing graduate studies in America because I was terribly poor. And that was a complete disaster. I didn't like America. I didn't like American academics. I didn't like the whole system. So I came back and returned to being a, leading a rambling life. That went on until 1977. So you see, I spent an awful lot of time just rambling around. And um, I also got married, you know, I'm very, very young. I was about 22 when I got married. I don't advise any of you to do that. Um, <laughs> And I had the misfortune that my very lovely first wife, she died when she was 24. And we went on a trip to North Africa. And she very tragically died very young. I mention that simply because it was a very formative experience in my life. And I'll come back to it later. Because I think translators basically have to live, you know. You can't translate an experience. You can't translate a novel that's talking about tragedy if you've never experienced tragedy in your life. Uh, or unless you have a very, very fertile imagination, of course. And I think I've always told my students, go and live, you know. Go and, don't, don't try and translate Balzac into Chinese if you've never lived, because Balzac's novels, they're all about life, you know. So I mentioned that for that, for that reason. Um, and then after that, after that event, I was extremely um, stricken, stricken with grief. I had to look after my two children on my own. I had a hard time until 1977 when I had the good fortune to, to meet another very lovely lady and marry her. And she turned out to be David's daughter, Rachel. So, you know, our lives were very, very closely interwoven in this way. And that, to me, that's not irrelevant. I don't want to be too personal, but it's important to put these facts before you. Because what I'm going to tell you is that this translation was a very personal thing. It was, a very, it was the product of a very close relationship that was built upon friendship, was built upon love, was built upon an ongoing um, uh, living partnership. And that, that's, that's the story of this whole project. That's why I have to mention this. Um, and eventually, um, after having got married, I, I, I moved with my wife to Australia, where I did a PhD. And the rest of it, I'm not going to bore you with now. Um, so, so we entered into a collaboration, and I'll, I'll give you some more facts about it. Now, just the other day, I was up at the Chinese University Library, where they have an archive dedicated to David Hawkes. I donated all the papers myself. I came across this letter 
which was a letter he wrote very late in his life to the person who was editing the bilingual edition of Hung Lo Meng. And in, in this letter, he, this is actually a, a handwritten draft for what became subsequently an email. And he says, um, your letter suggests that you have an exaggerated impression of the contribution I made to the achievements of my son-in-law, which does him a grave injustice. Now, this is the first time I'm showing you a document because a lot of this story I'm going to be continuing is illustrated by letters and documents, which is why I can vouch for it being true. And this is one of them. He's saying, he's saying to this young man, Fan Sheng Yu, who's editing the bilingual edition, you seem to have got the story all wrong, you know. I, our, our collaboration wasn't like that. Um, um, while translating the... Uh, God, I can't read that. I had a... <laughs> While he was translating the last 40 chapters, this is all shorthand, I had, of course, to show him my work. I had to show my work to him as it progressed so that he could confirm, conform to the decisions I had already made about names, etc. But apart from that, he had complete autonomy as a translator. I think the only contribution to his two volumes my only contribution to his two volumes was the concluding poem, Quatrain, on page 376 of the final volume. I had nothing at all to do with his translation of Sun Tzu Bing Fa or anything to do with his Liao Jai, except as an, as an appreciative reader. So this, I, I show this document at the very beginning, even though it's a very late document, because it's, it's, it's David Hawkes spelling out in very clear terms that we had total autonomy. In other words, I, nobody was polishing somebody else's draft. Nobody was working together in that sense. I did the last 40 chapters, he did the first 80 chapters, and we were completely autonomous. We did our own thing. And that, that theme will, will come back later. We'll see how. This is actually the, the title page of the bilingual edition, which is edited by this gentleman to whom David wrote that letter. This came out in 2012. Now, um, I think I've already skipped over these um, important early letters. Right, so this is, this is going back to the, the lady at Penguin Classics, okay? So she got in touch with David Hawkes and said to him, why don't you translate Hong Lo Meng? And he wrote back to her saying, I think I'd like to do it jointly with my young student, John Minford. What do you think of that? And as a result of that, uh, David wrote me a letter. You see, I kept, I kept all my letters. He wrote me a letter on the 20th of January, 1970. Dear John, delighted to hear from you, blah, 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 blah. Betty Radici read the the translation of Hung Lo Meng over Christmas. She is completely bitten by the novel, even in that disguise, and anxious that I should undertake the translation. She also leapt at the idea of the sort of collaboration with you I suggested when we met. So I've now sent her my translation of chapter one. This looks like turning into a serious offer, but I've explained I only made a tentative suggestion to you and have not had explicit comments. Let me know as and blah, blah, blah. So this is the very first written um, statement about the collaboration. And um, there should be another letter like that, but maybe it's gone somewhere else. And this was the final, this was the very first printing of the first volume in 1972. Actually, I think that should be 73. But, um, and you can see from this inscription, this is the copy that David gave to me. That's his seal, you see, Huo Ke Si Yin. And, and he inscribed it to my brother Stone, D.H. Now from that simple inscription, you can already tell that we had formed a close relationship. We regarded each other as brothers, right? Shi Xiong and Shi Di. He was my elder brother Stone, I was his younger brother Stone, right? So already at this stage, very early in the story, He's calling me his brother, his brother Stone. And that's terribly important. Because that, that, that signals the nature of this collaboration from the very start, 
very, from the very beginning, it was a brotherly, a brotherly friendship, a very close and brotherly friendship. Oh, God. Sorry. Now, in addition to publishers and advisors and authors and translators and the reading public, um, often things don't happen unless someone, some very kind-hearted, enlightened person is um, watching it and decides to intervene and give support. I mean, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a very enlightened uh, patron of this university called Sin Wai Kin, who sponsors my visits. And um, I'm very grateful to him, of course. And, and there are people like that in this world, you know. And in the case of our collaboration, we, we set off together in 1970 with very little um, financial support. I mean, I was very poor. David gave up his job, and we were both struggling financially. And then, you know, a couple of people, a couple of kind-hearted, enlightened individuals threw out what I call a lifeline, you see? A lifeline is what you throw out to someone when they're drowning, you see? You throw out a lifeline. And these, these two people, between them, were the ones who made it possible for us to continue. One was a gentleman called John Sparrow, John Sparrow, there we are. And he was the head of a college called All Souls College, which I've mentioned to you earlier on. And he, he got to hear, on the, on the Oxford sort of network, he got to hear that David was financially struggling and that he was involved in a very important literary project. And um, so he, he took the initiative to have David appointed as a senior research fellow at All Souls College altogether for 10 years. So for 10 years, um, they provided him with quite a generous salary, which enabled him to get on with his work without any financial concerns. Now, of course, David was a very famous, distinguished senior professor who had quit. I was just a young um, sort of liumang, you know, I was just a young um, nobody with, with not a penny to my name and, and a single parent with two kids. I mean, I was... I was pretty desperate, actually. And then a very, very, my, my, my lifeline came from a different person, this gentleman here, whose name was Liu Cunren. And he, he also got to hear of what, what I was doing. And he very generously, and he was a very generous, kind-hearted, enlightened person. That's why his name is that, you see. He's very full of Ren, you know, very, very human person. And he wrote and offered to organize a PhD scholarship for me. And, you know, I was desperately poor. I could only have enough money to buy, you know, porridge for my kids. And um, he wrote and he organized for me to go all the way to Australia and become his PhD student. And this supported me for three and a half years and I was able to um, survive. I think you're trying to signal that it's time for me to have a break. I'm so, so grateful to you, Esther. Let's have a short break now, okay? We'll get back to the story in a minute. Mm. Um, so I, I, I more or less brought us to the very beginning of this story and um, I now want to just very briefly um, pick up on some words from, from Cao Sui Qin because Hong Lam Meng is of course is the story behind the story this is the story of the story of the story of the story of the stone you see and when, when, when Cao Sui Qin wrote a preface about why he, why he came to write Hong Lam Meng. And I, I, I'll read the, Chinese, the English translation. He talks about how he remembers all the, the girls from his youth, you know, and the young ladies, and the wonderful young ladies. And he said, as I went over them one by one, examining and comparing them in my mind's eye, I'll, 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 I'll follow the Chinese here, yi yi si kao jiao chu, si jie qi xing zhi jian shi jie chu wo zhi shang. It suddenly came over me that these slips of girls, which is all they were then, were in every way, both morally and intellectually, superior to the grave and mustachioed signor I am now supposed to have become. You know, grave and mustachioed signor is war, war, tang tang xu mei. I mean, it's a wonderful translation apart from anything else. But I'm not concerned here with the translation. I'm concerned with the idea. Because the idea that, that fundamentally um, provided the motive force behind Hong Lam Meng was the author's memories of his youth and especially of 
the, the young ladies with whom he grew up in the pampered surroundings of his wealthy household. And um, as he says here, he doesn't want, it goes over, I resolve that however unsightly my own shortcomings might be, I must not, for the sake of keeping them hid, allow those wonderful girls to pass into oblivion without a memorial. I mean, this is, this is a wonderfully honest, a wonderfully straightforward account by the author of how he came to write his novel. It's based on his memories of all his, basically his girl cousins, and of course you'll meet them all in the novel, you know, whether it be Lin Da Yu, Xie Bao Chai, you know, Jia Tan Chun, Ying Chun, Xi Chun, all these girls, you know, Shi Xiang Yun. I mean, it's a novel about girls, you see. I mean, most of the men in Hong Lamang are just appalling, you know. You wouldn't want to meet any of them. You wouldn't want to spend the evening. In fact, we could have an interesting discussion about who's your favorite male character in Hong Lamang, you know, apart from Jia Bao Yu, and he's really a girl, you see. But I mean, you know, when I think about all those men, I mean, my goodness, I wouldn't want to sit down for a meal with Jia Lian, you know, and I wouldn't want, as for Jia Zheng, you know, my goodness, such a boring character, and, you know, um, so on as a Jia Yu Sun, oh my God, they're all appalling, you know, and Jia Zheng, you know, um, the, the, the father of Jia Rong, I mean, these guys are really bad news, but the girls are, of course, absolutely wonderful. And um, so that's, that is the motive force behind the novel. And you see, one of my themes is, is how you cannot separate translation from life any more than you can separate literature from life. Hong Lo Meng is an autobiographical novel, more or less. It's a novel about the memories of, of the author's past and of the young girls that he grew up with. And to a certain extent, there's, there's an element of that in the translation, and that's what I'm going to very briefly mention now. So this is the picture of my very beautiful first wife, who, as I mentioned earlier, died at a very young age, and um, uh, with, whom, with whom I had two children. And this is the lovely picture of my second wife, who passed away some three and a half years ago. So, you know, I, I, I am, as they say in the, in the business, I am not unacquainted with grief. I know what it's about. I, know, I, I have some experience of the meaning of the two key words, love and grief. And these are wor words and ideas which are very central to Hong Lao Meng. And I, I mention this in passing, I don't want to dwell upon it, but it's important if I'm trying to tell this story honestly, that I, I mention some of the very important factors in my own life. And there are, there are many others, of course, but these are, these are some of the ones I want to mention. Now, from now on, I'm going to be really basing myself exclusively on letters written by David to myself. I was going to, going to talk about my letters written to him, but I frankly, I ran out of time this week, so I'll talk about them next week. I've got all my letters to him. He kept all of my letters. I kept all of his letters. So the extraordinary thing is that after all these years, we have a complete correspondence between the two of us. 75 letters from him to me, 75 letters from me to him. It's an extraordinary collection. Um, Now, the earliest letters were the ones about the contract. I'm not going to talk about those. This is one of his first letters to me, um, dated um, September 1973, when I got back from America. And I was, um, by this stage, I was, um, uh, uh, my first wife died about six months before that. I was in a very a very um, vulnerable, very fragile condition. And his, his letters to me were always extremely full of, of kindness and sympathy. He was in Oxford, there's his address in Oxford, and he was writing to me. And at the time, I, I, I must have visited, I must have come to visit him earlier on, because I lent him various books. And one of them I lent him was a book called Lilith, because our friendship was it wasn't just personal, it was also based on a, on a mutual um, love of literature. He would tell me about a book, I would tell him about a book. He would lend me a book, I would lend him a book. We, we also were both very fond of music and art. And we, we used to talk together about these things all the time. It was a very, in that sense, a very, um, a very literary friendship. And I would often lend him books. On this occasion, I lent him one of my favorite... Um, how does this thing work? 
one of my favorite novels, not very well known, it's a 19th century novel called Lilith. And he said, Lilith is amazing, you know. And he says, yeah, but MacDonald, oh, I, I was so grateful for the loan. I, Lilith is amazing, I shall try to read some other things by him. Um, and um, we continued to correspond about literature all throughout his life, right up till the last days. I remember the year before he died, he wrote to me and said, um, I really want to read some modern Chinese writing because I haven't read anything for years. Could you send me some stuff? So I sent him one or two books. I sent him um, some Zhang Ai Ling. He hated Zhang Ai Ling. He couldn't bear the way she wrote. Um, I, I sent him some tr novels by Mo Yen. He thought Mo Yen was the worst writer he'd ever read. <laughs> the great Nobel Prize winning Mo Yen. Um, then I sent him something by Bai Xian Yong and he absolutely adored Bai Xian Yong, okay? And, um, and then finally I sent him uh, Gao Xingjian's Ling Shan and he absolutely loved Gao Xingjian. So, you know, he continued reading literature literally up to the end of his life. And, um, and I cont we continued to share ideas. He guided me all the time because he had a very, very sure judgment of literature. He wasn't just a kind of narrow-minded Chinese scholar. He was someone who, who read literature for its own sake and who had a very strong sense of what was good writing and what wasn't. Um, and in this, but also in this letter he's writing to me about some Indian, Indian sinologists. Ven Kataramanan is one. And, um, and because I was interested at that time, I was, I was a young man searching for meaning in life, you know. In the hippie period we all thought that, you know, wisdom came from the East, you know, especially from India. So we all, like the Beatles, all went to India, you know, and they worshipped their guru, you know. And I thought to myself, maybe I can go to India and discover the meaning of life. And I thought I would investigate the possibilities of going to Rabindranath Tagore's university in Santini Ketan. And I checked out all the people there who taught Chinese. And it turned out that David knew them all, because they'd all been to Beida in the 40s. So he wrote to me about them. And then, um, this is a typical one of his, what I call, throwaway lines, because he, he had his very personal views about literature. And, he, and at the end of this um, letter he wrote, Why are the Victorians, MacDonald not accepted unfortunately, so obsessed by dear little child mothers? And he just had these ideas, you know, because it's quite true, Dickens and many other Victorian writers were obsessed with the idea of young um, child mothers. I mean, Lilith was such a person. Women who were so innocent and so childlike that they worshipped them. But when they actually came face to face with them in real life, they couldn't cope with them at all. It was a Victorian obsession. And he was very interested in that. Um, now, this was a letter written um, uh, uh, a year later in 1974. And I should explain that as part of my um, rambling life, I then, at that stage, I joined a theatre company. I always liked theatre, music and art. I was never a scholar. I had great trouble trying to be a scholar, but at that time I, I joined a, a, a travelling theatre company. And they included um, an acrobat, a tightrope walker, and a, a man who specialised in making fireworks. And they were called the Welfare State, which was a kind of joke. And they, they, they lived up in the north of England, and they took me on um, as, as, as the person who would organize a school for the children of the theater company. Uh, so I was like their um, school teacher. And I lived in a little caravan up in the north of England. And he wrote to me, um, um, I hope Welfare State is working out all right. I hope Pops and Liv, those are my two kids, are settled and that you yourself are feeling less doom-laden. Please always remember that I trust you totally with the stone. It is only the doom load that I ever worry about. Now that's, for me, that's a paragraph that says everything about our collaboration and um, our relationship. Because here we are in, in um, 1974, 
Four years after signing the contract, and I've done absolutely nothing. I've produced not a single word of translation, you see. I've always been terribly bad at delivering anything on time, but in this case, I was really going beyond any reasonable um, you know, degree of lateness, because I'd simply, I was leading such a chaotic, um, rambling um, life, working for a theatre company, and so on and so forth, always on the road, always... Um, part of what, what you might call the alternative society, you know. And instead of saying to me, why aren't you bloody well hurrying up? You're being a lazy old, you're a lazy young man, get your act together. He writes me these lovely you know, letters saying, I trust you totally, you know. Now, why would he trust me, you know? Why would anyone trust me, you know? I don't even trust myself, you know, let alone anyone else trust me, but he did. And I don't know why. I mean, I was a student of his, I did pretty well in class, but I mean, you know, to, to, ask, to, to ask someone to join you on a project like this is an incredible um, expression of trust. And he kept reminding me all the way through our long collaboration, which lasted nearly 20 years, he kept telling me, you see, I trust you totally, you know. And then he said, I recently had to read all of your part. That's the whole social way, the last 40 chapters. I recently had to read all of it through rather carefully and realized, A, how marvelous most of it is, and B, how hard on you it must be to keep living through so many chapters of such unrelieved bitterness and shadow. So... There's several things in that paragraph that are worth commenting on. First of all, from the very outset, David thought the whole, the last 40 chapters were very good. Now, most, most um, politically correct Hong Shui Jia think the last 40 chapters are rubbish, you know. And, and we always had the same point of view about it, which is that the last 40 chapters contain some of the best writing in the novel, you know. And that's where Bai Xin Yong and I agree. And he's, but what he's saying here is that he reread the last 40 chapters and he realized how incredibly dark and, and, um, and um, depressing those chapters are and how difficult it must be for me, having recently lost my wife and so on and so forth, to relive this incredible um, sadness and so on. So in other words, this is not the way, you know, professional academics talk to each other, thank goodness, you know, because he wasn't a professional academic. He just resigned his chair. I certainly wasn't a professional academic. I was a kind of layabout, you know, a rambling a rambler. Now, this is a little bit later, in January 24, 74, and he wrote me a long, a long letter in between with lots of detailed comments. And he says he's, he's, he's worried that I might have, he might have offended me in some way, or that I've, you may have run into unforeseen misfortune. It's, inconceiv it's inexcusable of me to make this fuss when I'm not written to, because I so seldom write myself, and probably have written less than one letter to you for every five you've written to me, but I can't help it. So please send me a PC to yours truly, just to show that you're well. I mean, he became, in other words, he became like a father figure to me. And something I didn't mention in my timeline was that in the year 1969, well, no, more like 1970, my own father had passed away very young. So, in a sense, David became like a father figure. And this concern for my welfare was something he kept on expressing again and again and again. Um, and then I wrote to him and said, as part of my job running a school for this theatre group, I was inventing a new language for the kids because I thought it would be nice for the children to invent their own language. And he said, um, I wish I could join your class. I always loved, I also, I also got the kids to look at the night sky and draw maps of the sky. I always loved star watching and I invented several kinds of secret writing when I was younger. Mostly, I'm afraid, for writing my rudest thoughts. So, you know, he was engaging in a, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with me that was extremely caring, extremely kind, and also very perceptive and very personal. Now, this is an interesting um, card. It's on the back of a postcard. That's why it's a bit of a funny shape. But this is one of the recurring things that we discussed between ourselves. It's about 
how to translate the Hai Tang, the Hai Tang Show, the Poetry Club, which is created in the second volume by by um, Jia Baoyu's cousin, Jia Tan Chun, right? And um, he couldn't make up his mind for a long time whether to call it the Crab Tree Club or the Autumn Begonia because of the Chu Hai Tang and so on and so forth, or the White Begonia and so on. And he keeps some. Um, he keep, we, keep, we keep writing to each other about this. This is one of the few occasions on which I actually had some ideas of my own. Um, and then, later in, in 1974, we're now in October 1974, I quit my job at the theatre company and I moved back to Oxford, um, living in extreme poverty, and, um, but trying to keep up with my work, but failing enormously. I used to go in and, and visit Professor Hawkes every week and sit in his study with him and ask him questions. And on one occasion, he got quite angry with me. I mean, because I asked him, I kept asking him questions about chapter one. And he wanted me to be asking questions about chapter 81, you see. And, and, <laughs> I, I wrote to him and said, I think you were rather angry with me. And he wrote back, I wasn't angry last time you came, but at least not in the sense you probably thought. I was merely rather shattered because I'd thought almost up to the last minute that you'd finished translating a lot of stuff and that the few problems you wanted to raise had to do with your work on 81 to 120. Then it became apparent that you, we were back for the nth time to the wording of chapter 2 or whatever it was. And right now I need help with chapter 42 if anyone has any to give. I'm afraid that in my exasperation I failed to give real answers to some of the things you were, you were asking. Um, so I always think of that day as a bit of a turning point because he got, he got pretty fed up. Because here I was four years later, I'd done nothing, you know. I was still asking him questions about chapters one and two. And my goodness, if it was me on his, I'd have probably lost my temper too. And, um, and then this is, this is the last part of the letter. You said as you were leaving something about having something for me soon to tear to pieces. This too suggests a misunderstanding. I wouldn't read your work in that way if you ever gave me the pleasure of reading any. If you're really going to do this translation, I won't, be, I won't, I won't reproach you if you're not. But for God's sake, let me know within the next 12 months so that I can make my plans. If you're really going to do it, it's time you stopped rereading my work and got on with your own. You only scare yourself by reading my stuff over and over again. And if you feel frightened and guilty all the time, you'll end up by hating me and probably yourself too. And that will prevent you from ever doing anything. Don't forget that I've seen your work and admire it and trust you as a translator. There's nothing to, what's this word, something about, I can't read that. There's nothing to be scared about. But if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it, you must get on. I, not you, am the one who needs to be shown a few chapters by way of reassurance. Please don't answer this immediately, or come by, or come here by return of post. Think about it for a week. Forgive me if this is all, this whole letter is based on faulty diagnosis. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't based on anything faulty. He was being very honest. And he could be a very severe critic, you know, as well as being a very kind and sympathetic person. He could also be quite harsh sometimes. Um, and sometimes he wrote, this is, this is um, later in the same year, uh, November 1974, when we'd sort of got over that little tiff, you know, it was like a lover's tiff, you know. And, and he wrote me a friendly letter saying, I'm just on the last paragraph of 44, going rather chug chug puttery and not very inspired, I'm afraid. Um, and that's something that people often forget, is that a lot of translation quite, can sometimes be quite boring, you know. I remember Hawkes once saying to me, if I had to do another passage about somebody going down the, going down the corridor, turning left and going through the door into one street, finds a pub and out the back, down another corridor, I'll probably scream because it's so boring. And it comes a lot in Hong Lama. There's an awful lot of what you might call boring stuff, you know, about the preparation of food, about this, that and the other. And um, you've got to be able to keep going. Um, and then you see in this, in this letter, um, 
And he says, quite a lot of drama in chapter 44 before we get back to the interminable poetry club meetings. <laughs> well, that, of course, he loved the poetry club meetings. He translated all the poetry, but he just had to be a little bit sarcastic about it. Hope things are okay at your end. And then he mentions here in passing, Robin Zayner died very suddenly on the street last Sunday. Robin Zayner was one of his close friends at All Souls College, professor of Eastern religion. And he dedicated volume two of the story of the stone to Robin Zayner. This is just a little postcard about an expression in Hong Lamang referring to a garment in which he says that, um, he says, um, Jean, that's his wife, has still got a Chinese jacket lined with this very tight pearly lamb's wool. Maybe it's from newborn or recently born lambs. So sometimes he just sent me a quick postcard with some little detail like that. And I'm glad to say I kept them all. Ah, now we come to one of the difficult letters. <laughs> this was the letter from Betty Radici. Remember I showed you a picture of her. She was the editor at Penguin Classics. And she, um, she wrote me quite a harsh letter. Um, and she ends up saying, I don't enjoy writing a letter like this any more than you'll enjoy reading it. And she's sort of more or less telling me to just pull myself to, this was in 1975. And she was, she was the publisher of Penguin Classics. And I was producing virtually nothing, you know. And um, she, um, she wasn't happy. And she wrote this kind of letter, you see. I mean, that was written on a typewriter. That was before the days of computers, you know. Hard work writing a letter like that. Um, and as a result of her, this is again a confession on my part, as a result of her very harsh words about my translation, because she said I needed to learn how to write English and stuff like that, um, which is probably true, I decided to go and read something really third rate, something that would teach me how to write typical novel English, you know. So I, found, I happened to find this book lying around at home. It's a very famous book written for children called Little Lord Fauntleroy. And it's written by, by Francis Hodgson Burnett, who managed to imitate the style of 19th century fiction very well. And because the, because the work itself is of no interest whatsoever, I mean, it's just a, a very light-hearted um, novel written primarily for children or, or primarily to be read to children. Um, I was able to read through it with a view to just simply observing how this woman um, managed to write good narrative English, you know. Th there's a trick to it, you know. It's not, and because there was no actual content of any interest, I wasn't involved in the story at all. I was just looking at the words that she used. I learned more from reading that book than I did from almost anything else I ever read about translating. It taught me a huge amount about the accepted language of narrative fiction, you know, how you tell a story in the traditional mode of, of the novel. I just mentioned that to you because it came to me after reading that harsh letter from Betty. And here's another letter from Betty. Um, I have marked the dialogue in many places because I'm afraid I must ask you to take out all the current slang. And she, she was very, very critical. She used to say, um, you can't, um, we can't have these well brought up and articulate girls talking as intelligent as they do for three volumes and then degenerating into slipshod student argo. Oh my God. I more or less went off and shot myself after I read this letter. Because <laughs> she was just saying I didn't know how to do what, I didn't, have, didn't know how to do my job, you know. And I finally, um, I finally plucked out my courage and sent her some chapters, seven chapters, and she wrote me back a very, very critical and unfriendly, unfriendly letter. So, you know, I, I, I share this experience with you because we must never be discouraged. You know, we have to have, we have, to have courage and we have to have self-belief, self that's the other thing. Um, and then she wrote me, <laughs> well, later, a little bit later, she said, I have not heard from you since I sent, you, sent back your chapters and I'm anxious to to be sure that they are, were safely back. Could you please write? Of course I didn't write her. She was so unfriendly, I couldn't bring myself to. And um, she was a real 
she was a real, um, here's one of the pages where she wrote, you see, she didn't like my expression stomping around. She thought that was much too slangy. I don't think so at all. I mean, I just thought she was being a bit, and she couldn't, she decided, she went over every page, you see, and commented there, she thought I should have Roman, not Italic. I mean, nowadays, editors tend not to even read your stuff. They just, they just count the words on word count on Microsoft Word and send it straight to the copy editor, you know. But in her day, she read every page, and I'm very grateful to her. Now this is, this is an interesting letter from David because he was very concerned that Betty Radici would make me give up. So he wrote to me, um, Dear John, this is October 75, I meant to write yesterday, Radish, he just called her Radish, you see, that was his nickname for her. <laughs> you see, he was trying to keep me going. Radish rang me the night before last, having just finished reading your chapters. She seemed quite impressed on the whole but was very vehement against the dialogue. I admitted that I had reservations about some bits, but said that I thought different translators were bound to do things differently. However, I fear you may still be subjected to another broadside, and I'm worried that this may make you feel very low again, or even throw you off course altogether. Please try not to let her get you down. I'm convinced that she's a basically good-hearted person, but she has a rather bossy manner and is full of schoolmarmish pedantries. And then this is the best part. I never forgot this advice. Um, I find that the best way of dealing with the, the latter is to give in with, with to get to the best way of dealing with her pedantic corrections is to give in ostentatiously in cases where it doesn't much matter, but to be firmly polite but unyielding where you're quite sure you're right and she's wrong and you really care. Anyway, she loves the novel, so in the last resort she's on our side. I find I have to remind myself of that rather often when I read her comments on things. So he was giving me some very heartfelt advice about how to deal with my publisher, you know. Nowadays, publishers don't even, don't even write letters like that. Um, and this, was, this was a year later, May 1976, and in which he writes and says, Dear John, I've had a long, rather puzzling letter from Professor Liu of the Australian National University, written in Chinese characters about a millimetre high, in which he seems to be wanting to do you some sort of good. And this was the, this was the crucial letter that he received from from Professor Liu inviting me to go to Australia and that was my lifeline, you see. I was really sinking, I was really drowning after being bashed on the head by Betty Radici, no money, no nothing. And suddenly Professor Liu, um, like a fairy godmother, you know, he just invited me to Australia and I, I, I received a regular salary, I couldn't believe it. I was able to buy meat, you know, I hadn't eaten meat for months, you know, and even a bottle of wine from time to time and I, I bought a car, you know. Life was suddenly good, you know, thanks to Professor Liu. And of course then I met, um, and then I met um, uh, David's daughter and fell in love with her, married her, she came to Australia with me. And that's the next letter, you see, because finally David is He's told by his daughter that Rachel that she's going to marry me. You see, stupid girl. She she yielded to my persuasions. Anyway, and he wrote to me, dear John, the delightful notion that you are to be not only a co-worker but also a son is very slowly beginning to sink in. I fear I've been rather a grudging collaborator in the past, but I'll try to make amends. Um, so in other words, he's saying, you know, I'm very happy to learn that you're going to marry my daughter and you'll become my son, which is very sweet of him. I'm sure he regretted it afterwards, but... Um, <laughs> and so then he writes me a letter beginning, Dear Son John, you know, suddenly I've become his son instead of his brother, you know. Um, I just wanted to get some sort of idea of what he was like and what the nature of our collaboration, you know. It wasn't academic at all. Um, mm. uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, just a little comment in one of his letters, which from, from quite a lot later, this is um, already 1982, but I wanted to show you the kind of comments he made, because he was looking at my, looking at my translation of, of, of um, volume four. And he says, wouldn't, in the, in, the, in the chapter title here, wouldn't pursuance be better than pursuit? 
in the heading. It seems to me that lust, like desire, is something that, dri that drives you rather than something that you can pursue. That's the kind of way he thought. Although he was a very emotional person, he was also incredibly rational and very analytical about language. I learned a great deal from him in that way. Um, yeah, this is, this is also in that year, 1982, when he's talking about... Um, I was in, by that stage, I was in Hong Kong working at Chinese University and working with a man called Stephen Sung, Sung Chi, and we were going to organize the second international Hong Lo Meng conference. And I was going to be the person who did all the work. He was going to be the chairman. Um, and we planned to invite all the major Hong Lo Meng scholars from China, including the two main ones at the time, uh, two gentlemen by the name of Zhou Ru Chang and Wu Shi Chang. And David wrote back, and we invited David, of course, and he wrote back and said, if you really have all of those five people from Peking you mentioned in your letter, you'd better be prepared for some punch-ups. Because they all fight, they all fight each other, you know. Hong, Hong Shui is a kind of like, like major basketball league. They just all fight each other. I fear that Feng Chi Yung is a big party man, and I suppose pretty likely to get his way. Feng Chi Yung was like the next generation of Hong Shui Jia. He's, he's no longer alive. I personally think he's really bad news, but you obviously can't not have him. So he's giving me advice about all these big Hong Shui Jia, you see. Zhou Ru Chang and Wu Shu Chang are bitter enemies. Perhaps you could arrange for them to travel on different trains. <laughs> he had a wonderful sense of humor, right? Because you couldn't put Zhou Ru Chang and Wu Shu Chang in the same room. They literally couldn't stand each other. Hong Lam Meng has that effect on people, you know. In the, they either argue about whether Bao Chai is more beautiful than Dai Yu, or they argue about whether the whole social way is no good, or they always find something to get very angry about. And Zhou Ru Chang and Wu Shu Chang really hated each other. They used to attack each other in public. And once, um, once Zhou Ru Chang, he was very mischievous, Zhou Ru Chang published what he claimed to be some poems by Cao Shui Qin that he discovered. And Wu Shu Chang, Wrote, a, wrote an article hailing this discovery. And then Zhou Ru Chang said, oh no, I, fake, I made them up, they're fakes. And Wu Shi Chang wrote back and said, no, they're not, they're genuine. I know they're genuine. And Zhou Ru Chang said, no, they're not, I made them up. And they went on fighting about this for, for, for months. Um, it's so childish, you know. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now, this was, um, this was in um, February, 90, February, February 1983. I was still in Hong Kong, and um, one of his favorite topics was Peter Pan. And David hated Peter Pan. I was a big fan of Peter Pan. I always liked to reread Peter Pan. I last read Peter Pan on the MTR, traveling. I missed the station because I was so involved in Peter Pan. I think it's a wonderful story, but David thinks it's a very bad book. It's all about people not wanting to grow up, you know. But I never wanted to grow up, so I, he, he once told me I had a Peter Pan complex, you know. I'm sure I do have a Peter Pan complex. I also think Jiao Bao Yu had a Peter Pan complex, by the way. So I, I'm not too ashamed of having a Peter Pan complex. But David was very disapproving. Peter Pan has been done in London with a young man playing the lead. Because normally in London, in, in, in Britain, when they do Peter Pan on stage, it's a girl who plays Peter Pan. That's the tradition. Um, anyway. He thought, it must be very depressing to have no comeback after publishing volume four. I drifted into rereading it this morning instead of starting this or preparing my Monday class or doing any other of the things I ought to do on a Sunday. I like it more every time I read it, honestly. So he's given me some really genuine, sincere feedback. He likes it more and more. And then Jean, that's his wife, she got a friend a copy and we were waiting with some trepidation to see how she would react. She has always been a fan of Hong Lo Meng because became an enthusiastic one of Story of the Stone 1, 2, 3, and is now, I'm glad to report, an enthusiastic fan of yours. She's a very discriminating reader and one whose judgment I very greatly value. I hope you'll find this encouraging, as encouraging as I do, and not just think you're being cheered up. So, again, a recurring theme in his letters is trying to reassure me that, you know, 
what I'm doing is okay. I needed that reassurance. Well, this is an interesting thing I came across in his letters because, um, you know, there was a very, a very um, deluxe French translation of Hong Lamang, and he writes, "Have you seen the French Hong Lamang yet? Published in the Pléiad? It's very expensive and sort of expensive looking, but a mess." So you know, all the names are translated. So um, Joshua becomes Jia Le Clément. And so on. Can you believe it? Not just one uh, one set of Chinese illustrations, but practically all the illustrations that ever were, and cumbersome. Whereas Jacques Darcy's Au Bord de l'eau, that's a French translation of Shui Hu Duan, is streets better. So he was giving a very frank appraisal of the French translation of Hong Lamong. I think I'd better move ahead because I'm, as usual, I always subject people to much too much stuff. Um, this is another letter talking about Feng Chi Yung, who he didn't like at all. I think it's worth reading what he said. Um, oh yeah, Feng Chi Yung. That's F Q Y. Feng Chi Yung struck me as very much the party man, arid, arid. Sorry, I'm right, getting in the way of my own. Arid and pedantic, with something slightly bovine and peasant-like about him. A combination I find sometimes endearing and sometimes rather frightening. And there again he's talking about Feng Chiyong, who, who was not his kind of person. Um, this is just a reference to Bride's Head Revisited, which is one of his favorite things. Um, now, I want to just mention this because one of his friends in the Oxford academic world was a man called Freddie Beeson who was professor of Arabic and Freddie had to give a talk. I went to hear Freddie's Be Freddie, Freddie Beeson deliver the Bodleian le oration in Latin yesterday. I had to go because he'd rung me up to tell me he was giving it. What a weird occasion. The Oxford establishment telling each other with shades with, uh, with shakes of the head. What a lot of um, something, services they are, mm. sorry I can't read this, what a lot of mm. all, all the possible, all the pointless ceremony and time wasting business. I'm getting to the point, huh? Utterly meaningless and yet very, very taken very, very seriously. One sees what people like Bao Yu were up against. I just mention this because, you see, for him, Bao Yu was someone who was alive and well and actually part of his life. He would, or he would sometimes refer to Zhao Bao Yu as if there was, Zhao Bao Yu was living in his house, you know. So he says, one sees what people like Bao Yu, because he's just been complaining about the Oxford establishment. And of course, Bao Yu was a, was a very anti-establishment figure. Um, And on this occasion, he signs himself Wang Ge, right? A foolish brother, right? And this is interesting because in this letter, he talks about how he always thinks of the novel in terms of this triangle, where, where the left-hand connection between Bao Yu and Bao Chai is the approved bond, whereas the right-hand one between Bao Yu and Dai Yu is the true secret bond. Sometimes he just made remarks like that that were so enlightening about the novel. Now, this is pretty much the last thing I want to say, which is that towards the end of his work, this is in 1979, he started to realize that very soon he would finish his part of the translation. And I still hadn't produced volume four, so he was about to finish volume three, and he, he started to feel a sense what I, what, what I think one would call withdrawal symptoms. He wasn't quite sure what he would do after he finished. So he kept writing to me, I mean, I, about five or six times, he wrote saying, why don't I translate some of the last 40 chapters? Could I maybe do chapters 112 to blah, blah, blah? And I mean, every time I'm afraid I said no, you know. By this stage, I was well and truly involved. And the very nature of our collaboration was not like that, you see. 
So, in a sense, I had to hold him back. I had to say to him, no, this is my baby, you've done your baby, now let me finish mine, please. And he, he did respect that decision. He never once tried to oblige me. The only thing he did, and this I think is pretty much the final word about the collaboration, he came out to Australia in 1979, and we'd, we'd spent time together, just chatting, and one day he sat down with me in my office, and we looked at the first page of one of, my one of my chapters. He said, why don't we just go over this together? And he started writing comments in pencil, crossing out words and putting things in the margin. And after three hours of this discussion and improvement, he said, OK, I think that's about right now. And I just looked at it and I said to him, David, that's exactly what I put in the first place because he'd gone all the way around and come back, in fact, to my exact wording without realizing it. And he looked at me and said, my God, you're right. I've just been wasting our time. We'll never do this again. You see, what's interesting about that is that we were thinking along the same lines. We were more or less thinking as one person by that stage. This was after 10 years of collaboration. And our minds were actually working in the same way. So when he, when he tried to improve on my, 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 my translation, frankly, he didn't, because we ended up coming back to what I'd actually written in the first place. For, for me, that, that was a real lesson. We never tried to do that again. Um, this again is a typical comment of his. He says, when I, when I use the word rack, I use the word rack in my translation to put someone on the rack. He said, surely it's a bit misleading to introduce European substitutes. Everyone wants to, to know about Chinese tortures. Why not, why not use the word torture or something? And again, his improvements were always very light-hearted. You know. He never tried to sort of say, he was superior to me. And sometimes he just used to say, I think Tsai Sui Chin just forgets what he's called things sometimes anyway. So it's like he recognized, he recognized the frailty of the author. The, I mean, Tsai Sui Chin definitely made some mistakes. Um, this is where he said he enjoyed my translation of the Bagu one. He said, I still very much enjoy the parts I very much enjoyed before. The Bagu bit in particular is brilliant. That's when I translated the Bagu one into Latin, which I did on my own. That was entirely my idea, but he liked it very much. Um, this was a, when he wrote about a, a translation of mine. I translated a, an essay about the poetry, and he wrote some comments. And um, I, I translated this expression um, Xie uh, Fang's slanting wind. He said, slanting wind seems a bit funny. I suppose it's the fine rain that slants on the wind. Gerard Manley Hopkins would have found a word, no doubt. Again, he was immediately thinking of the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins as a way to try and help me find an, another expression. He liked my he liked that translation. I'm lost, this is 1979, I'm lost in admiration for your Chinese lyric translation. It's fiendishly difficult stuff to translate, but you seem to have handled it beautifully. So, um, He's still asking if he can have a few chapters to work on, you see. He wouldn't give up the idea, and I kept having to say no. Now this is, this is rather a, a, a touching piece. Um, I was thrilled to hear that you are on chapter 96. I wonder if you've decided definitely yet what you're going to call volume four. I called it The Death of Tears, or whether you have found a picture for its cover yet. I shall, I shall miss our sessions together. He, he, he enjoyed the sessions we had, even though they seemed to consist mostly of my saying that I didn't know what the things meant that you, wouldn't, um, that you couldn't understand. I just, um, I just used to enjoy talking about the dream with a zhiji or a zhiyin. I hope Professor Liu can, can solve some of your problems. So in other words, 
that's how he thought of our that that is how he thought of our collaboration you see it was a friendship along the lines of of the traditional Chinese idea of Zhi Yin you know and once he wrote um, I very much enjoyed reading chapters 95 to 98 they're certainly up to my standard if it doesn't seem insufferably conceited so he he's he's constantly trying to reassure me that my work was up to his standard which of course was, but I mean, very kind of him to say so. Um, and here, he would often refer to Fowler's Modern English Usage, which is a book nobody consults nowadays, but is this terribly important handbook to the writing of good English. I still recommend it to all my students. Fowler's Modern English Usage. In that respect, David was a very old-fashioned person. I'm not going to... Now, I'm going to pause there because I haven't I didn't have time to really do this section so I'm going to skip over it there's one or two slides I want to show you and then I shall end these letters I will talk about next week these are my letters to him um, and these are some of my um, some of my um, my notebooks that I can that I wrote during the course of of that time and this is a poem I wrote about translating Hong Lo Mong, which is very embarrassing. I was a very young man when I wrote it. I will, I, I will inflict that on you next, next week. Um, this is a long letter from, whoops, it is here. One of his, this was the letter from Professor Liu offering me that, um, I think that might be the end, actually. Hmm. Well, look, I'll try and sum up in a few words what I've been showing you, which is that, um, For one reason or another, the translation of the story of the stone has been pretty much universally recognized as a successful translation of Hong Lo One can go on and on and on about why it may be so. What I've tried to show you today, using as much as I can original documents and my own experiences, is the nature of that project, the nature of that collaboration, in the hope that it will encourage those of you who are budding translators, to feel confident in your work so that you can, in, you can engage with others in the spirit of friendship, in the spirit of, of the, joint, um, the joint love of literature that can inspire you to share with some other person, maybe another collaborator, um, some similar enterprise in the future. Thank you very much. to answer questions if anyone has the energy to ask them <laughs> but I will sit down <clears throat> you can ask any questions you like I don't mind um, or none if you prefer I don't mind that either Professor Minford, uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. And I'm more wondering uh, if the letters, they are in uh, a, a um, private collection right now. Mm. Are they available online? Like, is um, it digitized or like, how can we access the information? I, I've been discussing this with the, with the owner of the letters. Um, and he's happy to make them available. But uh, they probably won't be online. I think probably what we'll do is we'll make copies and we'll put them in the Hawks archive at Chinese University Library so that people can consult them. Um, but you know, um, I don't think they'll be put, actually put online. There's a lot of stuff online already in that archive. But I will, I will arrange for um, the, the copies of the letters to be accessible to readers who wish to go and consult them in, in the library. I think that's probably what we'll I have. I don't quite know. I'm, I'm seeing the the person who is the owner of the letter. I'm seeing him on Tuesday. I'll discuss it in more detail then. Um, I, he agrees they should be accessible to people, but you know, collectors are also concerned about their own possessions, you know, and um, I'll just have to see what he says. I think they, they won't be online. They probably, I don't think they'll be digitized. 
unless he says yes, I don't know. Maybe he will. I have no, I have no objection myself, but he may. You see, so I'll wait and see what he says. Thanks for your question. Thank you. But do go and have a look at the other stuff because there's some amazing. They've done a wonderful job of cataloging the whole collection, and someone's been through every single letter and summarised the contents and so on. And there are hundreds of letters, including a most remarkable letter from Chen Zhongshu, and all sorts of lots of letters from Rao Zongyi and people like that. It's a very interesting little archive, actually. I mean, as, as some of you would guess, I mean, I try to hold up these documents as another way of looking at the process of translation, which is more concrete than the use of some, you know, theory of translation, because none of this would fit into any theory that I know of. And if it does, I'm not interested anyway, but I mean, um, I'm trying to provide an alternative way of looking at translation that's more based on empirical truth rather than abstract theory, you know. That's been one of my long-lasting obsessions, as all of you who've studied with me will know, is, is that I'm sick and tired of hearing people who know nothing about translation deliver sermons about translation theory. And I think it's more important to look at the real, the real record of what actually happens in the process. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Professor Minford. Um, you talk about the collaboration uh, between you and uh, Professor Hawkes. Hock uh, I just wonder, back in those days, such a long time ago, without the assistance of a computer, um, I can imagine, you know, with such a such a long, you know, uh, 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 book. Um, so there must be a lot of uh, questions back and forth, and. How did you manage to, you know, I can see that with just a simple question, you will need to refer it in a detailed manner in order to have some meaningful discussions. So uh, I assume for, for such a lengthy uh, book, then, you know, the, the, the work must be enormous. Uh, did you really find it uh, uh, enjoyable or interesting to, to do it, or is it really just just a very uh, strenuous, uh, difficult uh, task to deal with. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Of course, I mean, I loved it every minute of it. I, was, I felt incredibly privileged and blessed from the very start to have this, to be allowed to take part in the recreation of one of humanity's greatest literary products. I mean, how could anyone not be overjoyed at that, you know? Of course it was hard work. I mean, I, I compiled piles and piles of handwritten notes, books and books of notes. Um, we exchanged letters, as I've talked about. Um, no, there were no computers involved. I only started using computers in 1982, by which time it was too late. So all the drafts were typewritten, and David would give me, he would make four copies of his typescript, the top copy and three carbon copies. I used to get the number three copy. I still have my carbon copies of volumes two and three. I don't know what happened to volume one. And, and there was constant, um, constant exchange of letters. I would visit his house once a week at least. We'd just sit down and talk, and just conversations, telephone calls, um, and, um, you know, um, the lending of books, the use of a good library, all these things were very helpful. But, but to, go, to go straight to your last question, there was never a moment when it was a, dr a, a, a dreary chore, you know. It was always an exciting, it was what kept me going for many, many years, you know. During a very da dark period in my life, I knew that there was always Hong Lamong waiting for me in my little room. I could go there and just try and do another page, or even half a page, or one line. And I felt this incredible um, presence in my life of something very, very, um, a very p powerful force for good, you know. So I, I never for one moment, that's why I never wanted to give up. Even though I, I got 
I made such slow progress that I got very despondent sometimes because it's, there was no other translation. I couldn't rely on anybody else's work, you know. There was a Russian translation and a Japanese translation, but I didn't know enough Russian or Japanese. So I was really on my own, and I had to, I had to work it all out for myself with help from my teacher. But I mean, um, so it was hard work, yes, but it was very, very rewarding. There was never a time when I felt that it was, you know, undesirably hard work. I always derived enormous pleasure from it. Enormous pleasure. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Minford, um, as you've introduced in your talk, this collaboration is, of course, based on many um, contingent factors and, and this wonderful uh, relationship between two translators. Uh, looking back at this long uh, collaboration, what would you have done differently if it was all um, up to you to arrange? For example, in terms of uh, the books, publishing, how it was marketed, how it was done, basically. How would I have changed? How would I have changed the course of destiny? I'm sorry, that's not something I get involved in. I'm afraid. Um, and no way I could have altered the course of that. I couldn't have. I could never have um, predicted how anything was going to go. It was not. You know. I mean, I went. I went into Professor Hawkes's office at the age of 23, saying I want to translate the whole of Hong Lao Meng, and not even knowing he was going to do it. So the alternative would be me sitting down on my own and trying to do it on my own. That would have been a disaster, you know. Well, what could I have changed? Nothing. I can't imagine how I could have. I mean, the whole thing had a momentum of its own, which was, which was strongly, um, uh, I mean, I have to say I believe in predestination, you know. Um, during, some of the, during one of the darkest periods of my life, my sister persuaded me to go to London to see a psychic clairvoyant. You know what I mean? Someone who can, communicates with the spirits of the dead, right? I don't normally do that kind of stuff. My sister does, she's a professional. Um, and she said, "There's this. The world's leading clairvoyant is in London at the London Centre for Psychic Research. I can make you an appointment." She was concerned for my well-being because I was very unwell, and um, so I went out to London, took the train, went to this Victorian house in Kensington, which was a very famous place where some of the great um, people in psychic research used to. Conan Doyle used to go there, um, and I went into this dark room. And in the corner was this man with a great beard, and the, the room was just one candle, and he was sitting in the corner, and by his side was a woman taking notes. And I went in and sat down, and he started to go into a trance, right, like this, shaking. And, um, and then he just started saying, the following is coming forward for you. And I, I just listened. And then my sister promises, absolutely swears, she tells about me at all. He started to say, the following is coming forward for you. There are two souls being reincarnated from China in the 18th century. Okay. I'm just telling you this because this is a true story. These two, so these two souls are, being, are, being, are predestined to perform a very important task. He didn't say what it was. Um, and he said, um, in due course, you will complete this task and you will become an authority on this subject. And this is part of your predestined. Um, this is part of your predestined um, fate, you know. And um, and then he went on to other things. And I, I just left that house shaking like a leaf, you know. And I mean, I don't know if I believe in predestination or not, you know. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But there are certainly some things in life which are very hard to explain, you know. Very hard to explain. And. Um, Professor Liu, you know, wrote a very interesting essay in which he said there's something, there is some element of predestination, he said, in the friendship between um, my student, John Minford, and myself, and Professor Hawkes. And he was a very calm, rational person, you know, but he also believed in Taoism and Buddhism. So he was an interesting guy. And he, if he could say that, you know, I think I can say it too. I don't know. I'm basically agnostic, but... Um, I think when something like that is at work, you better not interfere, you know. You better just let it take its course, you know. And even today, you know, um, 
48 years later, for goodness sake, I'm sitting here, you know, um, feeling part of this whole thing. It's an ongoing process. It doesn't stop, you know. It doesn't stop. And, um, <clears throat> and it's a wonderful thing that brings people together as well, because as you yourself know, you've only got to mention Hong La Mang to any Chinese person, and you suddenly open the door into a whole world, you know, a whole world of not just of the imagination, but of human experience, you know, of relationships, of the way people live, you know. It is, un, it is a unique book in the whole of Chinese literature in that sense. Of course, there are some wonderful other things in Chinese literature, some wonderful poetry and so on. But this novel is, is very special, and, um, and therefore, when it, when it came into my life, so to speak, um, I could just, all, all I could do was to try and um, live up to its promise, that's all as well as I could. There was nothing I could actually change, you know. So I can't really answer, I can't provide a better answer to your question, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I read it an anecdote saying that Chen Zhongshu received a letter from David Hawkes saying, um, could you um, just write a review for me about the, the story, the stone? And Chen Zhongshu replied that um, many translators found it, um, uh, found it uh, uh, many translators of the story found it stone, uh, found it uh, stone and, um, and left, it, left it as a brick but your translation still remains a stone, which um, um, just, just, uh, is reminiscent of the, uh, the Roman em Empire, uh, Emperor uh, Augustus, Caesar's uh, idea that I conquered the world, I, I left the wrong um, in stone, but I, uh, I, I left the wrong in brick, but I came back in a st stone. So the stone means um, marble, so the story of the Red Chamber is still a stone, means a, a marble. So the David Hawkes translation make the, the story better and more superior. So I'm wondering um, whether Professor David Hawkes and you also um, ask many reviewers to review your translation and, and are these letters still uh, accessible or uh, kept um, uh, concrete for us to uh, ha take a look at? take a look at. Mm. Yeah, this is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, of course, a very well-known story about Chen Zhongshu. And in fact, I think it was first made public by, by his student, Zhang Wongqi, you know. And um, I don't think David wrote to Chen Zhongshu. I think Chen Zhongshu just made this comment anyway. And um, it's quite funny because they knew each other quite well. I mean, David went to visit Chen Zhongshu when he was in China, went to visit him in Shanghai. and. Um, but he always used to joke to me about Chen Zhongshu that he's so clever that he doesn't understand anything, you know. <laughs> I mean, David was one of those people who was extremely irreverent, you know. He, he, he had an enormous admiration for Chen Zhongshu, but Chen Zhongshu could, could say something clever about anything, you know. He could say something clever about this glass of water, you know. He was just made to say clever things, you know. Um, but, and of course, his wonderful novel, Wei Chung, is very, very clever, you know, and, and you know, uh, all those essays of his are very clever. Um, my personal favorite essay by Chen Zhongshu is his, his essay on Lin Shu de Fan Yi, you know, which I think, for once, he's not trying to be too clever, you know. He's talking about, in fact, he talks about uh, predestination in that essay, you know, and he talks about the concept of Hua, you know. And it's one of his best things, I think. And he's a brilliant man, and I think he was trying to say something very clever about David's translation. You know. But frankly, it was so clever that it was a little bit lost on people. Um, and, um, you know, in, if, you, if you go to the David Hawkes archive at Chinese University Library, you'll find a letter written by Chen Zhongshu when he was invited to go to All Souls. He wrote this two-page letter in his beautiful calligraphy in classical Chinese, and David translated it for the Warden of All Souls, because the Warden didn't know Chinese. And in his translation, it's very humorous, because he provides lots of footnotes, because he wanted to, 
He wanted to let the, the warden understand that Chen Zhongshu was trying to show off the whole time, you know. This letter was just showing off, you know. And um, so I think, I, think that, um, I think that he was just trying to say something nice, you know. But being Chen Zhongshu, he had to say it in a very clever kind of way. And I don't think, um, I think there's a world of difference between Hong Lomong and Chen Zhongshu, you know. They're very, I mean, Chen Zhongshu belongs in the tradition of, you know, rule in Weish or that kind of thing, you know. The, 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 the clever scholar who was sometimes too clever for his own good, you know. Um, but anyway, thank you for mentioning that. It's an interesting anecdote, I agree. It's like something out of Shushu or Sinyu, you know. One of those little short stories that has a lot of content, yeah. Mm. Oh, uh, thank you, Professor Mingford. Uh, uh, I'm taking a translation criticism this term, and we were discussing the dialogue translation of Hong Longbong, and we were just we just did a presentation this this morning. So I'm wondering, you just mentioned that your editor uh, gave you some comments on the dialogue translation, and if you would like to share it more with us. And also, we were wondering that uh, if there's any literature. Uh, idea or something in in your English writing so uh, like if you and Professor David Hawks have any idea of how you how you would like to present the English in a literal way thank you very much um, yeah thank you um, I think that the first thing about dialogue I really had to learn you know I was very foolish. I was a young man. I thought, because I speak English, I can write dialogue, you know. But actually, it's very, very difficult to write good dialogue. If you look at some of the great masters of dialogue, like Oscar Wilde, for example, you know, his dialogue is just fantastic. But nobody speaks like that, you know, apart from Oscar Wilde, of course, because he always, he always spoke like a character from one of his plays. But um, to learn to write dialogue in a novel is very hard. You've really got to work hard. Um, as for the general reading, I mean, if you read, if you read Hawkes' work, what you realize is that he read everything. I mean, I'm, I'm discovering more and more in his translation how there are echoes of pretty much the whole of English literature, you know, in his English, because that's what he does. And of course, Tsar Chin was just the same, you know. Tsar Chin grew up in a family that knew the whole of Chinese literature. I mean, his father, Tsar Yin, you know, helped to compile the complete, the Chen Tang Shi and the Pei Wen Yunfu, and, and they, he grew up in a very, very well-educated environment. He'd read everything, you know, all the poems, all the novels and plays, and he was very familiar with Tang Xianzu, for example, and, and you know, um, Mu Dan Ting and all those wonderful plays by Tang Xianzu. He read all the Tang poets. He read all the Song Tzu poets. And he, he read everything. So I think that a translator who's going to be successful in the way that Hawkes was can achieve that only by virtue of having read everything. And for a start, Hawkes had read all of Shakespeare. And you find echoes of Shakespeare throughout his translation, throughout the translation, and echoes of... He was a great admirer, for example, of Henry James, of Charles Dickens, of um, um, George Meredith, and so on and so forth. I mean, he, he just read everything. And um, Milton, he was a great admirer of Milton. Um, and if you look through his letters, you find that he's often referring to the kind of things that he read. He was a great admirer of Evelyn Waugh's novel, Brideshead Revisited. So you can't, you can't point to any one thing. People just have to read, you know. And one of, the, one of the sad things today is that we don't encourage students to read enough, you know. In my day, the, the joke was that you, people would photocopy something and then they thought they'd read it, right? Nowadays, they don't even bother to photocopy, they just download it, you know. And then they think they've read it, but they haven't read anything at all, you know. But if you actually read a book, you actually have to go through a procedure whereby you actually digest what you're reading, you know. Read, learn, and inwardly digest. That's what they always say in the, in the church services. And, um, <clears throat> and therefore, in answer to your question, I'd say that all I can recommend is that you just read as much as you possibly can, you know. Every kind of literature, you know, popular literature, high, high, 
highbrow literature, lowbrow literature, dramatic literature, lyrical literature, you know, narrative literature, every kind. Because it's all about learning how to express yourself in, in, in the language concerned. And there's no other short there's no other way towards it except to read everything you can get your hands on, you know. Just read on the MTR, you know, read in the bathroom, read everywhere, you know, read when you're cooking lunch, you know, whatever. Um, because otherwise otherwise you won't have a long enough life to acquire the necessary skills. And it's just a question of reading as much as you possibly can, yeah. Mm. I think the young lady in front here had something to say. If we can bring her the microphone. Here we are. He's, he's running up the aisle. Uh, Professor Minford, mm. um, just now you mentioned like having manuscripts for your translation in the old days. Um, I'm just really curious, like now that you've got your computer, like how would you usually do your translation? Would you type it or handwrite it or like? <laughs> well, um, I used to say I write everything by hand, and then I put it on the computer, and then I print it out to correct paper. I'm very bad at correcting stuff on the screen, you know, my eyes get very tired and I like to have a physical object, you know. But nowadays I do often r translate straight onto the computer. I suppose I'm getting lazy in my old age, but I always used to say that writing by hand was a good way of getting your first draft done, you know. Because when you write something by hand there's a physical connection between you and the page, you know. And I, I, have a, I have a lot of problems with computer programs, you know. They always try and, they change the way you write, you know. That's what I hate about them. You know, nowadays they even say, are you writing a letter? And you, no, I'm not writing a letter, I'm sorry. You know, do you mean this? No, I don't mean that. And I mean, I hate that. I hate not being in control of the thing. So, um, and as for, as for track changes, I mean, that drives me. Oh, I just received the I just received the copy edited version of my new book, which is a translation of the Tao Te Ching, and um, they sent me the thing with track changes, and it just drives me mad. You know, I just want the thing on the paper. I prefer Betty Radice's 1975 handwritten comments. You know, um, but I do I do nowadays often type straight onto the computer. Yeah, I suppose as I say, it's because I'm getting lazy. But I do recommend writing by hand. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you so much for uh, your sharing and please excuse me because I would need to read two lines from the today's handouts before oh, yeah. I ask my questions. Yeah, please. Um, Go ahead. Uh, you s on the second page, uh, the last bit of the paragraph, it mm. says um, the Da to is the word as it occurs in the expression biao da, express. It has a sense of getting back out again from the original text and its meaning, so that in addition to knowing it, you can also express it. And you says that the second part, this da to, is unique to the translator and refers to the strange process by which the translator says goodbye to the original, the point at which the translator turns away and produces something new yet oh, uh, as it re-expresses what is already there, bound by the contract of Xin. Mm. And I was wondering when you said um, um, you needed the kind of reassurance from Prof Professor Hawks, um, even though you know uh, as you went along with your translation, you are, uh, it, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine, but when you, s showed the letter that he said um, um, uh, it is up to his standards and you said at that point you still needed that kind of reassurance. I was wondering if such um, like uh, is it because you see a difference between although you two work and think very uh, in a very similar way, you feel that there is a kind of uniqueness of translator and sometimes um, because if you want to achieve this second sense of da, it requires a lot of self-confidence and you know you're doing the so-called right thing or the most 
the greatest e effect or things that I'm sorry for making the question so complicated, but I was just wondering if mm. you it the kind of struggle has to do with this second sense of da and if not maybe just uh, anything that you would want to talk about this specific part. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very, very perceptive question. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that you've given some serious thought to this matter. And I'm so glad that you've read that bit because I wrote it a long time ago, but I just picked it up on my computer and shoved it down there because, um, and you touched on some very, very important issues. I think that if I go back to the relationship, it was between a master and an apprentice. You know, an apprentice is, it, it is the, the old Chinese idea of kou chuan, you know, where you hand something on from a master to a student, to a disciple, to an apprentice. I was always the apprentice, you know. I was always aware of being in, a, in, in the presence of a very, very superior master, you know, who had, um, because for a start he was like, um, 25 years older than me, he had a huge amount of experience, he had an incredible talent, an incredible, a genius, he was truly a genius. He was able to, to do things with words, you know. That's where we get to this business of da, you know, biao da da da. Because it's about, it's about, and of course it is linked to what you're saying, that's why I found what you said so perceptive. It is linked to self-confidence. You know, what they call in, in you know, the gift of the gab, you know. If you can say things, you know, if you can, what they, what they, in American gangster movies, they talk about, they, they talk, you talk pretty, you know. If you can talk, if you can express yourself, you're already halfway there, you know. And then you've got to be sure you say the right thing, but to start off with, you've got to say something, you know. And some people, they're just tongue-tied, they can't express themselves at all. And that's why I mentioned in that paragraph, there comes a point where you have to say goodbye to the Chinese, you know. You have to actually depart, you have to be free. And that's going to be very much the theme of my last lecture where I talk about the garden of perfect freedom. You have to be, you have to be brave enough to, to, to assert your, your, your right to be free. And that's a very difficult thing in the Chinese context because China is very possessive about its own culture, you know. They don't like it to be taken outside the walls of China. And people who, people who exert this very concept of freedom often are heavily criticized. I mean, David's translation has been very criticized in China, you know. For example, he refused to translate Hong as red. I mean, you know, who would do that? That's, some people think it's an elementary mistake. Of course it's not. He thought about it very deeply and very hard. And he wanted to express something deeper than that simple color, you know. He wanted to express a concept. And um, I, think, I think what you've focused on, which is so true, is that he encouraged me over the many years that we worked together. He encouraged me to have self-confidence. He encouraged me to do things that required a certain amount of um, bravado, you know. You just, for example, when I translated all of that section about writing Bagu, and you know, I finally translated it all into Latin, you know. And some people would just think it was crazy, you know. How can Jabayu write Latin, you know? But then you see, how can Jabayu speak English, you know? He doesn't speak English. And how can he, how can those actresses have French names? Translation is the art of the absurd, you know. And in order to enter into that, you've got to be prepared to throw caution to the winds. And at first, you, you're very nervous about it. You know, you're very lacking, at least I was as a young man, very lacking in self-confidence. And, and um, gradually, with, with, with the kind of teacher I had, luckily, he had very high standards, but he also was prepared to offer encouragement when it was due, you know. And I think that we often forget that today, that teachers often, they don't encourage enough, you know. We need to be more encouraging to younger, younger talent, because that's the only way they will develop and acquire that skill to express themselves. Because as you say, it's closely linked to self-confidence. It's closely linked to the feeling, I can do it, you know, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it better tomorrow. I can do it better this afternoon, you know, but I've got to keep on doing it. And then, 
and then I'll fail. I'll, I'll have some failures. That's okay. I'll, I'll get something wrong. You know, I'll misunderstand things. Yes, of course. That's fine. You know, who cares? You'll keep on doing it. You keep on getting better and better until finally you acquire the self-confidence and the skill to focus your self-expression very, very finely on um, the existing text as it, as, it, as it is. And that's, a, that's an ongoing process. It's still, I mean, believe it or not, I'm, I'm nearly 72 years old. I'm still studying every day, you know, in that line, you know, to try to improve my ability to express myself in my own language, as well as my ability to understand what what the Chinese writer is saying. The two go hand in hand, of course. That's why I talk about da da, because, you know, one of the first da is you go in, the second da is you come out. And of course, it's a joke as well, because there was a da da movement in art, you know, which abolished all rules and tried to revolutionize modern art, you know. So I, I, see, the, I, I see David Hawkes's philosophy as quite revolutionary in a way, quite, it changes the nature of the game, you know. Hmm. Thank you for your question. I think we should let people go. It's been a long afternoon. I think you must all be wanting to go home. Thank you very much for coming anyway.